It's the most listingest time of the year. Every content creator holds it dear. Every YouTuber, big and small, end of year list means so much to them all. Yes, that's right, everyone. 2021 is slowly but surely becoming just a faded image in our rear view mirror. I don't know about you, but my year was up and down, touch and go. I saw some real nice channel growth here and there, but I was also stuck inside, as with everyone else. I didn't get to do my normal traveling, my normal convention trips, didn't really get to collaborate with a lot of other people out there, but hey, them's the breaks, you know? Through the good and the bad of it all, though, we had comics, and because it's kind of a tradition in these parts, as my song before would let you know, it's time to rank my favorite. Not necessarily the best. Again, that's open for a lot of interpretation, but these are the stories that left their indelible mark on me, and the sort of stories that I would want to share with you, my wonderful viewers out there. Now, I call it a top 10, but really they're in no particular order. So now that we've set the ground rules and everything, now that I've got you all nice and prepped, let's get to the video, shall we? Cheers. So this book technically just makes the cut as the last issue hit in the early days of 2021, but it was such a good mystery book, I'd be remiss not to talk about it. As the title should let you know, this book from romance novelist Katana Collins is actually a spin-off slash continuation of Sean Gordon Murphy's Batman White Knight series. Did I mention that Collins and Murphy are married in real life? It's not important, but it's a fun fact all the same. The series sees Harley Quinn trying to rebuild her life and raise her two kids following the death of the Joker and the arrest of Batman, when a new black and white Hollywood-themed serial killer called the Starlet begins killing Gotham's biggest stars of yesteryear. Harley will be conscripted by Commissioner Rene Montoya and the GTO to help them solve of the murders a la Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, because after all, who knows the supervillain mind better than a psychiatrist turned supervillain like Harley. The book looks just amazing, and it sees Harley Quinn grab agency in a way that so many other Harley Quinn comic stories seem to battle with, and because it's an alternate universe, Colin can have a lot of fun playing with the relationship between Harley and Jack Napier, how they first met, and the roles that they would end up playing in each other's lives. I personally like that in this version, Harley is paying her way through med school by dancing in a burlesque show. Again, this is just so wonderful if you're a performing arts nerd like me and know the history with Comédie d'Arte, Harlequins, and how Collins is able to take that and now make it part of Harley's origin. By far my favorite thing though about this series is seeing Harley forced to team up with an FBI agent who as a young man, get this, was actually obsessed with Harley much in the same way she was obsessed with the Joker. Batman White Knight presents Harley Harley Quinn is a hell of a genre stew that should delight any fan of a Harley Quinn from any era. Just maybe read this one after the other two White Knight books, lest you be lost on what's actually going on. And hey, you know what? No holiday end of year list is complete without some honorable mentions, and because I was already talking about Harley Quinn, let's talk about another really great Harley Quinn book I loved this year, The Eat Bang Kill Tour from T. Franklin. This is a continuation slash spin-off, whatever you want to call it, of the Harley Quinn animated series, and the book manages to really capture that really hilarious, really off-the-wall kind of feel of the show, while also bringing its own unique flavor as well. I would say that this comic would probably win the award for the horniest book I read this year, which is really saying something when we have all those Hickman books going on. I liked this book so much, even after the writer followed me, asked for an interview, and then unfollowed me, I still put it on the list anyway, because it's just that good, and you should check it out. 2021 was the year that DC tried to put their house in order after several high-profile changes in stories that left fans reeling and not in a good way. Part of this initiative seemed to be putting the brunt of creative weight on the back of one man, Joshua Williamson, and thankfully, he was the right man for the job because he delivered in a big bad way. While Williams delivered several massive titles this year, for my money, the most impressive was Infinite Frontier, a multi-part miniseries that sought to explain what the DC landscape had become following the events of the major crisis death metal. Infinite Frontier really doesn't have one main character, instead choosing to tell several interconnecting stories featuring fan-favorite heroes who rarely ever get their moment in the sun. The main overarching concept is that the walls between the DC Universe's 52 Earths are thinner now than ever. And even regular Joe and Jane schmoes are aware that they aren't the only versions of themselves that exist in the Infinite Multiverse anymore. Which, as you can imagine, ends up causing no 
end of problems. I mean, for real, imagine if you knew another version of you existed out there on another world. Are you only good because they're evil? Are you only rich because they're poor? Does anything you in your life do actually have any meaning when every choice you've made is the opposite somewhere else? Also, if this is all so important, why is the superhero community, the people who are supposed to protect the world, gone out of their way to hide these secrets from everyone else? And hey, speaking of heroes, this book sees the return of Roy Harper. He's back from the dead, but now cursed with incredible powers that he doesn't understand. Then he got the Justice Society of America, who also come under attack by a mysterious force who kidnaps one of their own. Why even the likes of Cameron Chase and Thomas Wayne, the Flashpoint Batman, end up finding themselves getting trapped in this massive conspiracy involving the multiverse and the many forces that would seek to try and control it. In short, Infinite Frontier is a love letter to DC's almost 80 years worth of continuity, chop full of wonderful references and shoutouts, especially to the old Earth 2 books. It also just so happens to complete the admirable task of definitively answering questions that have been on fans' minds since the end of Death Metal. In that way, it is both a fun and satisfying read that also promises to be the first part in a much bigger storyline. Honorable mention time again, and while we're positively giving all the roses in the world to Joshua Williamson, we might as well talk about his other two big DC books this year, Robin and Deathstroke. Robin, much like Infinite Frontier, was a lot of housekeeping, a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of rehabbing for a character who had kind of fallen by the wayside and lost his way in other stories here. And what Williamson finds, the best way to get Robin back on track is by taking some very cool ideas from anime. Robin basically gets his own team arc. We get to introduce a ton of brand new characters. We get to feature a bunch of really awesome assassin characters. And speaking of assassins, we got Deathstroke Inc., which is really more of a fun kind of playful book with Deathstroke, which you probably wouldn't consider that those two things go together. But they do. So there you go. Two more Williamson books for you. Now, what if I told you that at the beginning of the year, one of the sweetest, most feel-good comic stories was going to be a mini-starring Thor supporting character, Beta Ray Bill? You'd probably call me crazy, right? And yet, here we stand with Daniel Warren Johnson managing to completely reinvent the wheel when it came to Beta Ray Bill. What starts as a fairly simple story about a hero going on a crazy cosmic road trip to get his signature magic hammer back quickly becomes so much more. Beta Ray Bill 2021 is a story all about self-acceptance, body image, personal growth, and in many ways, the shunning away of toxic masculinity. All great topics that comics don't regularly tackle, but this one did it all, and expertly so. And hey, did you know that Daniel Warren Johnson just didn't write it, he drew the hell out of it too. This book has such an amazing sense of motion to it, and if you're a fan of pro wrestling, like I certainly am, then these action scenes are going to blow your freaking mind. Whether it be Bill pulling off German suplex, or a Rainmaker elbow. This is one of those special books that only comes along every so often, one that completely reinvents how we see a comic book character. And whether you're an old school fan of Beta Ray Bill or you've never read him before, I can promise this is a trip you really want to take yourself. Now, naturally, you can't talk about Beta Ray Bill without talking about Thor. Donny Cates' new series almost made it on the list several times throughout this year. I really, really liked the Donald Blake arc. Seeing him come back, seeing him become such a threatening villain was super cool. And the rest of the book has an awesome premise, too, about Thor kind of becoming a mad king and kind of losing himself in this new job, having to rule Asgard and all the different pressures that come with it. We're in the middle of a Pet Avengers-style story right now which I was really not expecting. This book kind of changes itself from arc to arc, and you never really know what kind of Thor story you're going to be getting, but it's definitely something that I wanted to put on the honorable mention list. Now, the DC Animated Universe of Shows is probably one of the most important things in my early nerddom, and even now, all these years later, it colors my perception as a fan of comics. These shows were so amazing, and a part of me felt that their magic would never really manage to be captured again. But, lo and behold, along comes Justice League Infinity by J.M. DeMathis and a whole lot of other writers of the original Justice League cartoons to give us a continuation that I personally never thought possible. For those wondering, the book 
book picks up with the unfinished storyline of Amazo, who at the end of the series had become a godlike being who searched the depths of space for meaning. What he finds, though, ends up throwing the heroes of the Justice League into a multiversal adventure spanning a ton of different worlds, as well as familiar heroes and villains alike. Yes, I know, 2021 might go down as the year of the multiverse for better or worse, but this one was most definitely a high point. This wonderful hit of nostalgia-flavored dopamine was helped out by some amazing artwork that invoked the feeling of the show while never becoming all too slavish to it. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and all the rest sound exactly like I remember them, and Jam DeMathis is also not afraid to update things and have the heroes comment on some more topical issues that have been going on while the cartoon was off the air. It's one of those special stories that I feel is able to actually grow with the audience while also having plenty of fun and excitement, exploring all of these different alternate DC Earths, what they might look like, and the heroes that live there. In the last couple years, it's been really hard for me to find a super team book that interests me, but this one really had me from beginning to end, and it's one that you most certainly should not miss. Now, like I said previously, I've had a hard time really being able to sink my teeth into any brand new team book, but a late edition that ended up really changing my mind was Suicide Squad from Robbie Thompson. I don't think anyone was expecting this book to fly to the heights that it did during the very short-lived Tom Taylor years, but for what it's worth, I think Thompson is really doing something special here. We have a more villainous Amanda Waller who is turning her sights onto other worlds in the DC Universe. We got a cool team with Match of all people holding it down, kind of filling that role as a super person who wants to do good but can't do good because they're on a team like the Suicide Squad, which has always kind of been designed for bad characters, too good or to do good and to try and find redemption, but they never quite get it. It's a lot of fun. It's darkly hilarious. It definitely is something that I enjoy and something that I think you might enjoy too. Man, you know, I never thought I'd say I liked a Joker book more than I liked the main Batman book, but hey, that's just kind of the crazy year that 2021 was, am I right? The funniest part is, is that both Batman and the Joker were written by the same guy, James Tyne in the fourth, but felt like they were written on totally different planets. In truth, the Joker book is actually more about ex-commissioner Jim Gordon and his quest to bring a fleeing clown prince of crime to justice following the deadly A-Day gas attacks on Arkham Asylum. This is also without a doubt probably the best Jim Gordon story told in years, a serious adult neo-noir tale that sees Gordon hop around the globe uncovering sinister conspiracies that the Joker not only seems to be at the center of, but conspiracies that have been happening under Batman's nose for years. Tynan just finds so many amazing angles from which to approach Gordon as a character. He's the most moral and upstanding man in Gotham City next to Batman himself, yet he finds his deeply held beliefs about law and order repeatedly challenged by the chaotic force that is the Joker. This book also features a stellar supporting cast from Barbara Gordon and the other Batgirls to the returning Julia Pennyworth and even new characters like Vengeance, the cloned daughter of Bane. The Joker also just so happens to feature a very meaty set of backup stories that deals with Punchline, the Joker's newest protege in her trial of the century. Now is also probably a good a time as any to mention that 2021 will probably go down for for better or worse as the year of big comic book writers leaving DC and Marvel for Substack, and while I felt that the main Batman book, which was mostly made up of Fear State this year, suffered from Tynan's divided attention, this book, the Joker from issue to issue, remained great, remained interesting, and I'm super thankful for that. And now for the part of the video where I try and earn my indie comic cred by shedding some light on Something's Killing the Children and Department of Truth, two books that were also by James Tynan and were probably the biggest, most important thing in indie comics this year. Not only did they walk away with a ton of critical and financial success, but they also showed that there is still a real hunger and audience out there for horror comics and stuff outside the superhero norm. These two books also getting optioned to to be turned into Netflix series gave James Tyne the capital and probably the safety net that he needed to walk away from DC and walk away from writing Batman, which in and of itself is pretty goddamn massive. This year, one of the very best, most creative, most mind-bending superhero stories probably went under a lot of your radars, and I know this because Gene Luen Yang's short stint on Batman Superman got cancelled after only one arc. 
But I can say wholeheartedly with all enthusiasm in the world, this art called The Archive of Worlds was truly something special to behold. First things first, this book impressed me right out of the gate in how it chose to use the very unique medium of comic books to tell a story in a way that you've probably never seen before. You see, the first issue of this book could be read in two totally different ways, one side of a story focused on Batman and the other on Superman. By the end, these two stories would cross over, but they don't tell you that right away. But wait, that's just one layer. Pull it back and you'll see there's more. The Batman and Superman we follow in this book aren't the main universe versions of the heroes we know and love. Instead, they're multiversal versions modeled after the golden age of comics, but especially after the old black and white superhero serials. That's not to say main Earth Batman and Superman aren't in the book. They are. They're just playing smaller roles. For you see, the real threat in the Archive of Worlds is a brand new villain called the Auteur, a pretentious alien robotic life form who is trying to create the perfect superhero universe, even if it means playing God with several worlds worth of people. These include fun and exciting takes on classic characters like Lois Lane, who becomes a supervillain in a world where Superman dies, a Martha Wayne who survived her attack in Crime Alley to be the driving creating force behind Wayne Enterprises, as well as monster versions of all the classic Arkham inmates, just to name a few. In short, Batman Superman from Gene Lewin Yang was an experience. Unlike anything I've read this year, a wonderful mashup of so many different concepts and ideas, and if I can use my minimal power as a comic book YouTuber to get you to pick up one book you might have missed this year, I really hope it's this one. Now, obviously we can't talk about Superman stories in 2021 without talking about Graham Morrison's Superman and the Authority. Word is around this story that Morrison only took the job to save us the fans from what Dan DiDio had actually had planned for an older Superman, and for that, I'm always going to be grateful. Beyond that, it's also probably the most laser-focused superhero story Morrison has told in a very long time, and when they're on, they're really, really on. And hey, you know what, for that matter, I'll have two honorable mentions here. We mentioned Gene Lu and Yang, so we should really talk about the work he did over at Marvel with Shang-Chi. This was a deeply personal book, and one that actually allowed him to do some very necessary updating to the character. I'll always remember the scene where Shang straight up says, yeah, I kind of talked weird in other stories written by other writers, so let's actually try and meet that head on and basically deal with the whole, you know, implied racism of it all. It's really good and you should check both of those out. Dick Grayson has been through a lot the last couple years, hasn't he? He got shot in the head, lost his memory, started thinking his name was Rick, but thankfully that unpopular status quo was wiped away and fan favorite writer Tom Taylor saw Nightwing get back to basics and back to Bloodhaven even. Now on its own, that probably would have been more than enough to get all the fans rejoicing and want to read this new series, but in classic Tom Taylor fashion, he quickly ups the ante for this newest run. You see, following Alfred's death, Dick inherits a massive force from his beloved butler and father figure. Meaning not only is Nightwing rich, but he's richer than Batman, and he needs to decide what he's going to do with this newfound fortune. But hey, the book just doesn't focus on Dick Grayson as a superhero and agent for change. It also examines his love life with Barbara Gordon featured quite prominently and their will-they-won't-they they romance becoming a consistent B-plot for the series. There's also new revelations to be had about Dick's parents, the Flying Graysons, as well as as Dick's own connection to Bloodhaven's newest mob-backed mayor. Beyond that, I don't want to say much more for fear of spoilers, and to be fair, I can't say much more because that's pretty much all that's happened in Nightwing up until this point. Like every other Batman book this year, Nightwing got hijacked by the disappointing event Fear State, and all I'll say is if you do pick up Nightwing, feel free to skip all the tie-ins, you're not missing a thing. Now, the hardest part about putting Tom Taylor on this list was picking just one awesome book he wrote this year, because once again, the man had kind of an amazing year. There was a moment there where I almost thought to put Superman's Son of Kal-El on the list. I know the whole aging up of Jonathan Kent has always and still is pretty much a controversial topic within the fandom, but you cannot deny that the man made some real lemonade out of lemons on this one. It's probably the best take on a younger Superman dealing with personal problems while also so trying to save the world and live up to the image of his famous father. It's just good stuff. 
Then you got Marvel Dark Ages, which is a great post-apocalyptic take on the Marvel Universe where the heroes end up losing all electricity in the world and have to start over. It's fairly new, so it didn't make the list now, but it might end up making it next year. Same goes for Dark Knights of Steel, a Game of Thrones sword and sorcering up of the DC Universe. The man is just the king of the Elseworlds story, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. The Jonathan Hickman era of X-Men has probably spawned more truly great X titles than just about any this side of the Merry Mutants 90s heyday. Picking just one from this current run is a real hard task as most of them are pretty damn excellent and every personal taste feels represented. Last year I showered all the love and admiration in the world over the dark comedy team book that was The Hellions, a series that sadly came to an end in 2021 but it was a very satisfying conclusion. This year though I want to shine the light on Cy Spurrier's Nightcrawler centric epic way of of X. The overall plot might seem simple enough. Kirk Wagner has been tasked by Professor X to try and find a new mutant religion, one that can unite their fledgling nation of Krakoa under one banner. Okay, that's not a simple task at all. What follows is several stellar one-and-done stories, all that focus on a different aspect of the mutants' new life and laws on the island of Krakoa. Few books I read in 2021 felt this adult, this mature, and this truly ponderous. It helps that Spurrier assembles a hell of a support cast to assist Nightcrawler on his personal crusade. There's Legion, a mutant who might as well be a god given how powerful he is, Dr. Nemesis, a scientist and cynic who balances out the holiness of Kurt. Hell, even Dazzler of all people end up playing a big part in this story by the end. It's through this eclectic cast we get stories told about sex, restorative justice, and especially the topic of faith, all very hard subjects that most comics try to avoid if they can, but not Way of X. I will say, though, that the weakest part of this series might be when they're not dealing with big ideas or insightful contemplations and instead when they try and get to the topic of saving mutant kind from the rebirth of famous X-Fo onslaught. But for what it's worth, it's a minor misstep and doesn't tarnish what in my mind was still the best X-Men story amongst a sea of amazing X-Men titles this year, one that is totally worth your time, assuming you're looking for something a little bit more challenging than your average superhero fair. Time now to shower some love on some friends of the channel. We got two here for the honorable mention segment, and that is Radiant Black from Kyle Higgins and Avengers Tech On from Jim Zub. Both are actually kind of similar in a lot of ways. Big love letters to Tokusatsu, Power Rangers, and giant robot action, but through the prism of superhero stuff. I enjoyed them both a whole lot, even if I didn't get to read as much of them as I wanted to, and I'm hoping to change that next year. Well now, if there was any book on the shelves right now that was going to be a shoe in for my end of the year top 10 list, you just knew it was going to be this one. Chip Zdarsky, Marco Cicchetto, and the whole team on that book have really moved from strength to strength, telling one of the greatest Daredevil sagas of the modern era, which is really saying something when we stop and consider how many truly groundbreaking Daredevil runs there are out there. 2021, for the most part, dealt with Matt Murdock choosing to go to jail in a grandiose, almost Shakespearean act of self-imposed flagellation and Catholic guilt following the accidental slaying of a criminal. While inside, Matt sees how the other half truly live, fights both prisoners and guards who want him dead, while also uncovering a massive conspiracy involving the New York penal system and massive recidivism rates just for good measure. It's all a very pointed indictment of the for-profit prison system in America, and one that comes at a very timely moment in history for sure. But that's just one half of the story. The other pillar of the book involves Electra Nachos, most frequently a lover and occasional antagonist to Matt, taking up the Daredevil mantle for herself while he's away. At first she does it for totally selfish reasons, but as the book goes on we begin to see Electra soften and move from cold-hearted assassin to anti-hero to eventually someone who understands the fragility of human life and why someone like Matt does what he does. Then of course we got the third part of the Daredevil Holy Trinity, and that being the kingpin Wilson Fisk, who if being made mayor of New York City wasn't hard enough, we see Wilson go on his own journey of trust to eventually fall in love with Typhoid Mary. Every new issue is just so layered, nuanced, and thematic in a way so few comics I read this year are. To say every issue is an event unto itself is an understatement. This series also feels like it might be reaching the end of the road, too, as it spawned its own mega-event, Devil's Reign, which began around the same time I started writing this video. Yep, there's no two ways about it. Daredevil by Chip Zdarsky is a 
modern masterpiece and a must-read for any self-respecting comic fan out there. You know who else had an amazing year in 2021? Jed McKay. Be it his new helming of the Moon Knight book, taking that book into some interesting and out there directions while also staying true to everything that's come to the character of Mark Spector before, getting Moon Knight ready for their big multimedia push on TV and beyond, and also Black Cat. So many people have told me that Black Cat book is great, and the fact that people are saying a Black Cat book is good must mean it's amazing. So good on you, Jed McKay. I don't think I'm telling tales out of school when I say that DC's Black Label line of comics has been having a real identity crisis the last few years. What started life as a line sold on being more mature and refined ended up mostly just putting out a bunch of the same old, same old Batman miniseries, but with bigger pages and maybe some light cursing here and there. For a minute there, I really felt like no one was actually going to take the reins and do something artistic with the imprint. Well, in 2021, John Ridley did well at actually just that with the other history of the DC Universe. In fact, it was one of the first books announced for Black Label, but only finished up in 2021, but I digress. Other History is a book that sought to re-examine the contribution of DC's ethnically diverse superhero community with heroes like Black Lightning, Renee Montoya, and Katana. That on its own is plenty admirable, but in a Herculean creative effort from Ridley, this series also sought to tie together characters' entire stop-start publication history by couching them against the backdrop of very real American history, every issue involving a brand new decade. Complete with complex deep dives into the socio-political climate that was going on in the country at that point in history. In short, Other History is a love letter to the medium of comics and heroes who meant so much to a certain underserviced and underrepresented group of readers. Ridley never wallows in nostalgia, though quite the opposite. The writing has some real fire and righteous fury to it all. We see characters like Jon Stewart and Mal Duncan held to task for their white creators who, while they may have had the best intentions at heart in trying to integrate the superhero universe, they may have ended up telling some pretty racist stories themselves anyway. Which is all the more reason why this book feels so much more powerful because Ridley is essentially giving these characters their voices back and letting them tell their sides of the story for the first time ever. All of this could very easily have ended up becoming finger-waggy, but thankfully that never happens. Ridley creates fully formed characters complete with shortcomings and personal demons completely separate from any prejudices. Though don't worry, prejudice is most definitely explored within the text itself. How could it not be? It's just one of the many reasons why this book feels like such an important work. We are watching a real act of cultural reclamation here. But We Are the Reader is also being reminded why these characters matter so much in a modern context, perhaps now more than ever. It's a a sprawling saga that manages to capture a time and a place while also feeling very current, perhaps even timeless. Other History is a testament to comic books as an art form and also as an avenue to share necessary lessons about history, the good, the bad, and also the ugly. And so there you have it everyone, another top 10 list for another year. I hope you enjoyed the video and as always down in the comments section below, tell me what books did you really like this year? Chances are I probably missed some pretty great ones. But beyond that, that'll just about do it for me. So until then, everyone, I have been Cape Joel. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all again next year. Bye-bye.